Hello, this is Rob Hirschfeld, and the September 24th DevOps Lunch and Learn was all about infrastructure as code. And we had a very uh, good discussion about what is infrastructure as code, critical components. Um, I don't think we narrowed the definition at all, but we certainly talked about critical things that we want to consider in infrastructure as code. Um, and why it's important and what tools we think work and, and don't and generally agreed that nothing's doing what we want and started defining what we do want. So productive conversation. Enjoy it. The 2030 Duck Cloud. Thanks. A couple of weeks ago, I posted a, like just asking what is infrastructure as code? Can people define it? And uh, I got a ton of really interesting um, feedback, like four, I have four pages of, of cut and paste from Twitter. Um, and I sort of have my own ideas on it. What I was hoping we would do is, is figure out something that we could, we could point to as a working definition as a, as a group. Um, I thought that would be fun. <laughs> Might make people mad, but... It's, it's an interesting topic. I am curious what precipitated this discussion. I mean, was there, was there any dispute? Uh, was there any disagreements, what it actually was? Any functional disagreements where it actually mattered? Or is this just philosophical? It's not philosophical. Um, I have disagreements all the time with people. What is infrastructure as code? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, there's people I, I missed. Thank you for poking me, everybody in the background. Sorry. Um, and um, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's definitely functional. There's a lot of organizations that are working on infrastructure as code um, priorities and tooling and platforms. And then I'm starting to see as a differentiation, Terraform and Terraform Enterprise, which I think are separate things. And somebody was challenging me on that and was like, no, it's Terraform. And I'm like, no, I think they're different. And same with Ansible and Ansible Tower because people have been calling Ansible infrastructure as code, which I would have um, would push back on for people. Um, and so- Is that simply I, because there's qualifications to it, such as it's only infrastructure as code if that Ansible code happens to be checked into Git, happens to be used in part <laughs> of some overall overall architecture, or is that just a, I'm a hating on Ansible in general? No, so, so the reason I was trying to say about functional is, is this the case where there are people that cannot do what the task they need to do, a function they need to do, uh, till this gets resolved? Or, I mean, you know, whatever works, works. Um, and then, you know, you can tease apart, well, this is code, this is config, this is, you know, still being able to make control statements on configurations, et cetera. Well, et cetera. Partially, I think uh, it it may have been... It may have been driven by a comment I made parenthetically to Rob because my my <laughs> company is is in the process of reorging, and next year, you know, uh, what's currently defined as infrastructure as code will be in a new org. And for us, that means Puppet, um, it means Terraform, and it means and it means Ansible, but it doesn't mean Rack N. And I was a little surprised by that. So you know, that's why I. Put a bug in, in Rob's ear about you know. So what's your definition of infrastructure as code? Because I, I rack in to me is far more structured than uh, even Ansible playbooks, as far as I'm concerned. Even though it can call Ansible playbooks, but the way we use it is very data driven and and config driven versus you know uh, I feel like Ansible playbooks are a little more ad hoc almost. That's just an opinion. I and this is so. There, this isn't just coming, you know, David, from from you. Although, you know, I'm always interested in, in those conversations um, on a one on one basis too. But uh, a year ago, I wrote something about infrastructure as code for DevOps.com, and um, I actually came out with a whole bunch of stuff from it, but it doesn't matter what I say. It's really where the industry is moving. And I feel like the industry has been moving quite a bit in a year about what they think infrastructure as code is. But I mean, I, RG, to give you a, to give you a, a concrete rationale is if you're building automation, 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, most of us building automation are frustrated by it. Like it's, it feels incomplete is the, the way I'm, I'm speaking more broadly that I, I think that that's sort of the sense I get. Um, and people want the experience to be more code-like. Yep. But they don't, they don't know what that means. Like how does, how does, what's the requirement for that? And if you look at the, the questions, I, this, one, this one was better. I actually think it was closer. The first time I did this, it was everything from uh, it's just YAML, it's Kubernetes YAML, it's you know CI/CD pipeline. It's, there's a, there's this huge spectrum, and I think that if you're going to go to you know executives in an organization and say, I think our company should do more infrastructure as code, um, you need to point to what it is. Understandable, but you know it's. Yeah it has always been an evolution, right? So I've been in the industry long mm -hmm. enough and, you know, working at hyperscalers from way back when I was at AS1, um, uh, an ISP, a BBN, right? So we did programmatic infrastructure as well. It was nowhere close to as elegant as it is right now. I mean, I'm talking tickle TK where, you know, you hit a state <laughs> and then wait for an echo response. So, you know, that, but that was what the infrastructure as code meant back then. We still had our own, you know, gen convert compiling. We did nightly downloads. We checked if the pre-compiled would actually compile on a simulator for Cisco Juniper, et cetera, before we pushed the configs out. We still had config repositories. This is 1996, 97, right? Uh, again, right. it was, you know, was it always reliable? No, like, you know, I'd say about, 40% of the time it would work, but when it would work, it would save you intense amounts of time and automation. Yeah, uh, right. You know, I mean, I'm talking about real, real primitives, like, you know, base motherboard powering on an entire rack one by one by one, things that you do even now. But again, it wasn't as reliable, um, extremely imperative. And I saw some distinctions being drawn between IAC as declarative versus imperative. Um, I don't agree. I mean, you know, in some cases you need it to be imperative. Um, there's, there's only so much overloading you can do. Um, so it, it has been going on. And if you say, well, we got to tie in CICD as well. And unless CICD is in there, it's not IAC. Um, I, I don't know if that is agreeable either, right? As much automation as you can do, perhaps that's good, but just my thoughts. <laughs> no, no I, I like where you're going. I, I was taking this from topics because you, you hit a whole bunch of topics that I think are critical to think about for, for yeah. it. And, and there's a, to me, there's a Venn diagram in what you're describing that I think we can sort of inch towards a, these are things that we consider um, required aspirationally beyond it just being automation. Yep. If you will. Right. Cause the, I, and there are a couple of people who look like they want to talk, so I'll shut up for a minute. I was going to say, like, so I'd ask a couple of questions, right, that might help get some clarity to it. Um, you know, one is CI, CD, is that part of the code, right? When we talk about infrastructure of code, does it need to cover the entire tool network required to deliver service? And then the second question that might be easier to answer is what are the frustrations people are having right now with the current tool sets? I like that start. I like that as a starting point. Right. And you know, from my perspective, you know, we were a big time salt shop. It, it did not scale with complexity. It became more problematic as our infrastructure grew, and it was not easily decomposed. And you had to put lots of scripts to glue things together, which is what we're trying not to do. Which is, you know, kind of the, the point about it not being fully declared. And I'd like to add, uh, is because we're talking a lot of ops stuff. Day zero, day one, day two, day minus one. Do we need to have day <laughs> minus one in there? Probably. And, and also, I mean, yes, we're, we're talking infrastructure as code. Uh, where does the, where's the cutoff between infrastructure as code and just code? Like, what uh, is the difference actually... between infrastructure and, and software itself? Good um, question. That was actually something that Adam um, in, in, the, in the thread actually spent a lot of time talking about. Um, 
Chef Chef Adam, um, Adam Jacob, um, is that the way he defined it, uh, code doesn't include state, it's immutable. And so it acts on state, but it, it isn't. And so uh, to me, this is a, a classic conundrum, right? Is automation, most of our automation tools are more code-like, they're, they're static, and then they act on infrastructure. They, they don't include the state in there. Does that, does that class, does that help? Um, yes. Yes, it does. Uh, I mean, well, it, do, it, do we do we agree? If that is the case, just one caveat, and I'll I'll, I'll let you finish. Uh, why do we draw a distinction between uh, item potent code and not? If we are not talking about state, at some point you have to make sure that code, you know, if it's if it's stateless, if mm -hmm. it's you know some transient error, I can still get the desired changes on there. So at some point when I'm drawing a distinction, what type of code do I actually implement? Um, I have to allow for item potency, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's not poking and looking at state, but I have to allow for that. So there is some relevance to understanding of state as well. Right, but I right. would, I mean, if, if I was gonna flip that into the frustrations, when I look at the DSLs that we use for automation, they are really bad at at accommodating um, system state when they take actions. My, I'm, I'm, my, one of my, my frustrations is that, and, and item potency is, is a, is a, is a bandaid for this, but the idea that I have to write a script and it's going to be basically trashing my system. If, if the system's not in exactly the right state, um, that, that, that lack of state to me has, has been problematic. And, and that is perhaps a, a, a different perspective where, where we can distinguish IAC from just code is that at, at least in, for the majority of the code that I can think of off the top of my head, it's event driven, microservices, etc. You, 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 you get an input, you process it, you produce an output. With infrastructure as code, um, bringing this towards the, uh, the previous discussion, this is, I feel that it's more state-driven. We have a desired state and an existing state. And for the most part, infrastructure as code serves the function of reconciling those two. Do you think the reconciler pattern is a core thing and when we talk about infrastructure as code? I do. I, I, I mean, I'm I welcome different opinions, but uh, yeah. I actually, I strongly agree on it. That's why I'm... Yeah, I would have said, yeah. I mean, once you get into complex systems and the distributed systems, I think it's absolutely required. Yes. The, the thing that to me makes that problematic with the things we call infrastructure as code, where we were sort of going with, with Ansible, hating on Ansible, is there's no concept in a tool like Ansible that it is going to do actual reconciliation. Like you can change the inventory file and give it different inputs, but it's I don't consider that a reconciler pattern. Ansible <laughs> is a weak reconciler. Yes, it, um, okay. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's for the most part, uh, demand driven, like you, on, on, unless you run uh, Ansible on, on, on the node itself, like Ansible poll with, with, with a timer uh, or <laughs> cron job, yeah. you, you, you're, you're basically running uh, Ansible on demand when you want to change the state. So, so the reconciliation happens not automatically, but... Uh, but it's, at, but it, it doesn't even pull inventory back, right? Unless you're figuring out some dynamic inventory component. If you build an Ansible inventory, you you run it and then you're done. You could rerun it if you've made it item potent. I mean, uh, Terraform is better. I mean, I, I, to me, this is why people get excited about Terraform as infrastructure as code. It has a really strong reconciling pattern. Right. It does, but it's still triggered by, by your affecting a, you know, a change. Yeah. But get, you know, uh, uh, GitHub hook commit kind of thing if you're using enterprise or that kind of thing. 
Like it doesn't sit there and pull the infrastructure. Have you changed? Let me put you back, like Puppet does. You know, Git GitOps would be more infrastructure as code, like in terms of reconciliation. Uh, like when you look at Argo CD or, or WeFlux or or any of those, um, they are domain specific to Kubernetes. Um, but right. yeah, uh, the the this is a common shortcoming with the infrastructure as code, at least the, the, the way I see it. Uh, and, and this is mostly, I feel it's driven by legacy that a lot of these tools, starting with Ansible and Terraform as well, even Puppet, they are, the reconciliation is not a continuous process. You can emulate continuity by running a cron job to run it every five minutes or so, but it there's no implicit continuity. Right, but but hold it. Go ahead. It's simple to say that that it, it was an afterthought. It wasn't core to the <laughs> I the, the thing that's weird about those those products, which right, they do that uh, recon they do, but I wouldn't have called that reconciliation exactly. It it is an inf like a an, a state a configuration enforcement. But it's not messing with the infrastructure at all. It's messing with the configuration of the infrastructure on the infrastructure. When we think about Terraform Reconciler, it's actually building infrastructure. It's, it's using APIs to build infrastructure. But it's external to the, the OS. Is I think crossing, it's how you write it. Is crossing right. those we, boundaries important? It's all, I, 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 not a puppet user, but I mean, certainly install, we could make it manipulate infrastructure scale up, scale down, scale out, you know? So I think, but it wasn't, it was just not clean and it wasn't reliable. What, what I see missing uh, in Terraform is the two-way event uh, pipeline. Right now, you can tell the Terraform, this, I, I, I want to update my desired state Terraform fetches its database, what, what it thinks should be, compares it to what actually is, and reconciles it. Right. But we are lacking the, the event hooks going the other way around. Let's say AWS, for some reason, kills an instance. Terraform doesn't know about it until we run it again. Right. So... Well. so so there's the eventual reconciliation when, when we run it manually again, but once, once we got an alert about an instance going away, but there's no continuous reconciliation. Unless you're running Terraform Enterprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is Terraform Enterprise actually doing continuous reconciliation? So is it running the plan for you over and over again? It's supposed to be, yeah. That's one of, that's one of the, the, the features of Terraform Enterprise, at least when I looked, was in the beta for it. I, I, I didn't move forward after they started wanting to charge people. Well, then, then you start, if you need continuous reconciliation, always maintaining desired state, then that needs to not sit outside. That needs to be a part of the infrastructure. Kubernetes, classic example, right? So, but that's all software. Yes. No. Right, so that, that... I say where um, you need continuous uh, reconciliation if you're going to do disaster recovery, disaster mitigation, because if you're not constantly watching the system and say a region or uh, a circuit goes down in a data center or uh, a UPS blows or something, and suddenly those hardware resources no longer exist. If you don't have continuous rec reconciliation, you're not going to be able to keep the system up in any sort of form. You need to be able to uh, plan and fold back and, and prune off unimportant stuff if you're going to try and stay mission critical. I, I like what you're describing. Isn't that a manager though, or a monitor? Like, is this an infrastructure as code manager for what you're describing? Um, as opposed to the infrastructure as code itself? 
Well, I think the reconciler is part of the manager. You have okay. to have a reconciler before you can have a manager. You need something that hmm. continuously has current state. So, so, so. That brings a bunch of, of questions. So I'm not 100% sure what constitutes a manager in, in a, a salt world that's a salt master mm -hmm. um, that is managing the state of those things. Um, uh, and, you know, the problem with state, as soon as you have state, it, it, it breaks. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so when I when I think about um, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I know Tara from the other ones. I just haven't spent the last 10 years on them like that. So but um, that's cool. That state is painful. Right. You have to distribute the state to the edges. Right. Um, the tools weren't built for it. The, the salt message bus, I can do bidirectional eventing. It doesn't scale because it wasn't part of what it was designed to actually do into it. Um, so I'm not sure what you mean by manager. It'd be good to understand a little bit more about that. I, I see telemetry data coming in from my monitoring alerts. I have information about my desired state of the infrastructure. I have some reconciliation to those. What, what do you think a manager is? I, I guess when I think of Terraform, Community Edition versus Terraform Enterprise, I've been asking the question is, are they different products or one product? Um, just like Ansible and Ansible Tower, one of them is a, a Ansible manager or a Terraform manager. Um, and you could you could implement Terraform in other ways, actually. You could you could manage Terraform or Ansible in other ways. So to me, the manager adds in, like none, neither Ansible or Terraform really have, um, I mean, Terraform has a local state thing, but there's no way to address it or update it or change it. Um, you have to move it into another into another tool to make that the state systems that they have um, uh, usable from a, con a continuum a management perspective. Yeah. And I know in Salt, the things to fix that security became their enterprise edition as well. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question about it. I mean, how usable, when you start doing this at any level of scale, do you find any of the tools usable? Uh, no, it's a short answer. I mean, of the, of the point tools, like, and there's two ways to go scale. There's number of machines, but there's also team size. Right. So, so if you're going to take infrastructure as code to the next generation, don't we need to be something that's scalable and more simplistic and not tied together with scripts? Because that's what you pretty much have today. Yeah, the tied together with script stuff doesn't scale. <laughs> well, so is that, would, would that be, what is tied together with scripts? I agree. I, I fundamentally think I understand. I'm drilling in because I want to when you say tied together with scripts, that means there's a person who's writing bespoke code to stitch together their automation components, right? They're not, they're not actually collab like the state of one tool is not shared with the state of another tool. The state or it's simple tasks, for example, like deciding um, which user certificates are going to get pushed out, right? That, that's additional code that winds up getting written in Python or whatever language. If you add a host, someone who's added DNS in, grab an event hook, add DNS in. Our, our salt states were described by the engineers as, as the most advanced code <laughs> and most complex code in the entire enterprise. And, and it literally took people months to get up to speed because just trying to track how all the decompositions put together where everything was, at a top level, like deploying a storage cluster was really cute. It was four lines of code in the state file that kicked off 200 more state files that were together with a whole bunch of scripts, right? So every time you deployed it, here's the way I would define state. Every time you deployed it, operations had to have, quote, a DevOps buddy to fix things when they broke. And is there, how do we move that into a more code-like, I mean, can't, is, or is, is infrastructure as code saying we want those capabilities, but in a more code-like way? What is what is is that? Because what you're describing, I mean, I I live, I've seen it's it's 
you know, every one of these, you can't. Here comes the magic where people say, we do it with AI. <laughs> oh, don't say that. But, but that's, yeah. like I said, that's the magic. That won't work because until you understand the system, you can't abstract it. No, it took us months and months to even get close to applying machine learning to adoptimizing TCP stacks. I mean, yep, it's a exactly. long learning curve. It's a long learning and, curve. <laughs> and it's not really AI anyway. So, <laughs> but yes, uh, and, been... until there is a base of experience, there, there's really no way to train a system because what do you train it with? Well, there's no experience, so it can't be trained. Yeah. There's, there's another aspect to this that to me makes the AI stuff super hard, but even going back to what John was saying, when you're dealing with infrastructure as code, a lot of times you don't get to choose the environment. Um, yep. And this this to me is the place where infrastructure as code is is sort of wonky. It's like, you know, John, every, every line of code that you're, you're in that system served a purpose. And in a lot of cases, those purposes were things that you couldn't, you couldn't wish away. Like you can't refactor, you know, the Amazon APIs in a way that makes them easier to use, or you know, make Google's APIs closer to Amazon so you don't have to deal with quirks. Um, and that's true for hardware. It's true, right? You know, if you need certificates injected, that's, you know, it's a, it's a different system than your DNS entries, which is a different system than your procurement operations and your network, I mean, all the networking topology stuff is different. Well, that's <clears throat> that's a distinction between imperative and declarative, right? If you are mm -hmm. understanding infrastructure as code as simply declarative, then you have to allow for, well, it should be, it's a common provider and, you know, I need to have some uh, kind of overloading uh, written within, say, Terraform provider itself that I poke and I say, what is the environment that I'm going to execute this provider on versus provider B versus provider C? Um, so, you know, you're embedding some kind of, some level of um, imperative uh, detonation of config based on the environment. But, I mean, that's that's as subtle as you can get. So, so do you think that what Terraform did for... Um... <laughs> to what ter like Terraform built all of these abstractions in providers, but they're all different. And, and they're all broken because none of them have to report back to state when things break. There's uh, holes in all these tools. So no, that's, they don't, that's right. Let, let's look back to OAM for a second and see if this helps, right? Um, so there's a concept of separation of concerns in this. And it's so like today, if I'm going to go write some infrastructure as code, I need a developer mm -hmm. and a DevOps engineer, or if I'm lucky enough, one that knows both to go write that code, right? I can't easily abstract, you know, what the developer needs and how that actually gets provisioned, right? So you know, one of the things OEM was gearing towards is simply to say, I need a database. I need a message queue. I need X, Y, and Z. So that what a developer needs to know is extremely limited into specifying the set of resources they require, right? And then the second abstraction, which kind of gears to that point, Rob, is you know the infrastructure abstraction was trying to standardize a set of APIs between you know the operations team and the cloud provider team, so that there is a normalized fashion. It doesn't really matter um, what you ask for. The way I specify that should be the same, irrespective of whether it's AWS or GCP or Azure. Right, so there's there's some components in here about how do we? I think there's what's the desired state? Where do we really want it to be? Right, we, we'd like it all to be composed into the single responsibility. We'd like it to be um, uh, uh, put together in such a way we have flexibility across different cloud providers. Right, we don't have to worry about those components to it. Uh, we'd like to not write scripts. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, so I think it's kind of, it'd be interesting to understand what the desired state is and then to understand the gap between what we have and what we'd like it to look like, at least for me. No, I, I, I agree with you. Um, Two. Sorry, yes, I agree with you. <laughs> um, that's what I'm, what I, I guess part of what I want to do is think about the aspirational definition, if, if, that, if that's what you and I are both, both saying. What, what would we like? But to me, that's what infrastructure as code is the is sort of the aspirational definition. It's like we want 
to be writing, we want to be as productive writing infrastructure automation and as process focused as a developer would be writing an application all in one language against, you know, a database in the back end, right? Yeah, and I think that's where, you know, I'm not saying OEM is the right model, but at least starting to understand, you know, what does it mean to the different consumers of infrastructure as code? And, and what are our pain points was not a horrible way of, of doing it. Um, and, and for the record, I, I will never write another infrastructure in Chef, Puppet, Salt. I, I just know they don't scale, you know? Hmm. Uh, so I will not do that ever again. I also have uh, sworn off loosely typed languages, no more Python. Yay! <laughs> so John, what are you going with? Go, Rust? Yeah, we do everything in Go internally. Okay. What's we, by the way? I'm sorry. Uh, it's just uh, we're working on an open source project that has a component of this as part of it. Uh, startup I'm working on right now, but um, the the yeah, I, it, it's just I can't tell you how many times. I mean, just um, you know, it, it's they they end of life Python 2.7 and everything blows up because now there's no libraries out there, as if all the code in the world for Python 2.7 <laughs> disappeared on one date and time. Um, you know, every, every release of salt upgrading where they added a field, removed a field, um, and all of a sudden you're, you're got cascading failures across the planet. Um, they, they just, yeah, I mean, the first thing that I look at is what language are they written in? Okay, it, it's it's Python or some long, okay, they're off the list. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I agree with you really, really strongly so when we built. It, it ends up being, I think, I think the intra intractable problem ends up being where do you push of uh, the complexity, right? So if you if your understanding of infrastructure as code, whether that's configuration or whether that's uh, you know a YAML or something, or um, wh whether that's even you know some kind of uh, say step function or control statements, uh, it can become kind of easy to solve, but a lot of that needs to be handled within the object you're going to operate on, right? If there are commonly understood definitions of, well, you know, a, let's say a queue needs to implement push, pop, et cetera. Um, and if that's the case, if that's always true across AWS, GCP, Azure, et cetera, then it's relatively easy to say, okay, provider, this is the cloud I'm going to operate on. Here is a microservice for a queue or this is the heap I'm gonna work on. Um, this is uh, you know, an RDS instance I'm gonna implement. Make sure that gets implemented in common CRUD operations. They're always supported. If you can do that, right? But again, you know, you're, you're now relying on commonly understood definitions of services. You know, a queue across any CRUD service provider will implement these four methods, five methods. Um, then it becomes easier to start writing infrastructure as code. And that will, you know, run across multiple clouds. That you can do, but, you know, both sides being open greenfield, you know, everything is allowed, permissible, then you can't get to this nirvana. Well, I mean, what you're describing sounds like what I used to see the multi-cloud tools try and do by creating like a, you know, a, a cloud library, cloud the cloud API layer, right? Mm -hmm. About what, five, five years ago, maybe a little bit more. Um, yeah, what well, we cloud we scale? Building, that all right? Cloud scale was doing it. Um, right scale, whatever. Right I scale. Think... Right scale did it. Um, I'm thinking in Stratius had a Java. There was a cloud. Uh, do y'all remember these? There was there was a yeah, Java library. There was the this, cloud this, cloud shim this, layer. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I cloud. Do. And this was the problem back then as well, right? Will you have consensus? Will every cloud provider's understanding of services, microservices, will they be similar? Um, you know, going back to fundamentals of computer programming, uh, will they do this implementation? And of course, you know, clearly they wouldn't. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we supported, I think, 17 cloud providers. We, <laughs> we started with the different lib clouds and everything else. And at the end of the day, we had to write our own abstraction for each of the cloud providers that was actually out there. Right. Um, and so, you know, what I look at is, so what's the closest thing to provide standardized interfaces today? Right, with, with some work to do is it's it's Kubernetes running on most clouds. Yep. Right. I, I start to get an abstraction. So Kubernetes to me is is not as important as an orchestration system. I think it's a pretty good place to start with. It, it's closer to what we want, 
you know, using custom controllers and, and operators mm -hmm. gets me far closer to what I want than any other tool out there. Yep. That's interesting. I guess from my perspective, Kubernetes is above the infrastructure layer. Are you thinking it's a the patterns to then manage the infrastructure it's uh, both, around I mean, it? Yeah, so if I've got a node in Kubernetes, right, I, I am exposing that infrastructure, I'm exposing storage. I am I'm associating attributes with it. This has a, a VPU uh, or it's got a GPU, it's got whatever associated with it. And then I'm orchestrating workloads on top of that infrastructure. So it definitely has an infrastructure view. It's network abstraction is still weak and it needs improvement. Um, you know, and then the Kubernetes multi-cluster project has lost its way, you know, but the notion on that was to start creating the abstraction layers between, um, you know, a, a management node that really does nothing more than kind of the management function Rocky was describing, and its job is only to manage lower nodes inside of the network. Um, you know, but I, I'm sorry, like a year ago, they sat there and, and were literally talking about saying, you know, we haven't released anything in two years, should we start over because we don't like the way we designed it? Not that I haven't said that a hundred times. Yeah, which I mean, which which you're thinking the multi multi manager project for them, or? Well, it, it's changed. There's there's been a couple of projects. There's a Kubernetes um, uh, uh, Kubernetes multi cluster uh, component to it. There, and, and one project's died off. One still. Uh, in fact, I, I sit on the calls fre frequently, but m more often than not, because usually what I get there's no new topics. Call canceled. Mm -hmm. um, but it was basically the notion of Kubernetes, you have an API server um, that exists on each one of these servers. And let's say uh, I, I have 10 clusters. I want to be able to say, go deploy this deployment. And I tell it to the management server, which then implements the reconcil reconciliation pattern with the 10 clusters. Right. So it's keeping one consistent set of, of primitives and then basically enforcing them downstream. Uh, but they've really made very, very little progress on that. Is this, and, is this the cluster APIs pieces that you're thinking of? That's or a is this piece. cluster, the cluster manage, cluster manager? Now this is a it's SIG multi-cluster, I'm pretty sure. Okay. I can okay. tell you in yeah, a second. No, no, I'm making sure I understand because I have I have concerns about the um, cluster API pieces along this. There, there's, it's a similar similar challenge, right? I, so what, what you're describing to me falls, I mean, I, I'm totally I, I think that that I think the Kubernetes patterns are actually are really good and they work inside of Kubernetes to me I still don't think of that as as infrastructure like all the stuff that goes around outside of Kubernetes is you know is the infrastructure pieces um, and the concern of Kubernetes abstracting all that stuff away is good inside of Kubernetes but you you have to deal with the sharp edges of the infrastructure around Kubernetes to, to provide the abstractions. It doesn't eliminate it. This is my struggle, yeah. It doesn't eliminate it, right? And and yeah, this is one of the reasons I started looking at the cross-plane platform. Mm -hmm. um, and that I, I think that the abstraction layer they didn't carry through in Kubernetes, um, and I kind of wish they had, is, is you know creating a persistent volume, some class of storage. Right, whether it's family provisions or statically provisioned, and the persistent volume claim. Right, so I, as an application, want this. You, know, you somehow go provide that. They didn't carry that abstraction across the rest of the infrastructure. But what the cross-plane um, team did is take that and start applying it to to non-Kubernetes resources. Right, so the RDS, the message queues, the other pieces where I can describe it in application layer how I want to do that. But they get right back into the same problem, which is, you know, okay, now I've got to write a provider for GPC. I got to write a provider for AWS. And then that same set of a failure of abstractions is, is not there, which I think one of the reasons why they were so quickly to jump on OEM, right? Where, where that abstraction layer was now kind of trying to be defined in the OEM side. They went into that, you know, big time in terms of, of jumping on board that way because they're feeling the same points. I think we all are. But these are all, you know, to the point of maturity levels, right? These tools aren't commercial ready. Right, they're 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 aspirational in direction, right? But but they're not there today. And the thing that you're you like about them, the direction that they're trying to go aspirationally, is reconciler pattern abstraction from that perspective, right? Clean API from for that. So those are those are things we can capture as infrastructure as code objectives. 
I think the other thing that they did that's important is, um, yeah, the problem with Kubernetes, the problem with the Kubernetes multi-cluster is everything in their world is Kubernetes, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I don't think there's many enterprises that are greenfield. None. Right, so so we, we have to have APIs to support bringing along brownfield applications. And I think that's some of what the, the cross-plane platform attempted to do. So that was the other kind of piece to it is, is it's not gonna be perfect, right? There, there are gonna be kludges in how we bring those applications along, but that's the other part about, you know, how do you migrate from legacy platforms to a more modern platform? You have to have a path to get there. I, I, I actually think that if we're gonna talk infrastructure as code, the priority of brownfield or what I would say multi-API um, is much more significant of a component than um, right. I, I would actually say that this, if we're going to do infrastructure as code, we don't, we don't always get to choose our infrastructures. That to me is part of the problem with the Kubernetes pieces. It's like, as long as it fits in the Kubernetes mold, it's good. But that's, that's a huge restricting statement right at the start. I'm not going to disagree. Yeah. I mean, we, we started out saying it was Kubernetes first because that's where we could, and I'm, I'm talking Ericsson now, the, the notion was we'd go Kubernetes first because mm -hmm. <clears throat> the other marketplaces were pretty well saturated. There was no place to be innovative in the other marketplaces. Um, Kubernetes was much more wide open, right? But the first set of applications forced us back to bare metal. <laughs> you know, we couldn't even run VMs on it. Um, but I would say that's an economic question um, in, in the sense of, if, if I'm talking to a, a business owner, they don't care what infrastructure it runs on. Uh, other than when I'll get some executive coming down saying, hey, we just signed a deal with HP, switch to their cloud. <laughs> yeah, those things happen. <laughs> Uh, well, they do care if you're telling them I, you have to buy new new gear to make it work, right? They care about the cost, right? But I don't think you're gonna have a, a CIO or even a, 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 a certainly a, a CTO come down and say, "I want you to do A, B, C, and D." It, it, it can happen because they've got a special vendor relationship, and we want you to go do. And we were forced to run an HP kit, yeah, until they saw how much it cost them, and then they let us do what we wanted to. <laughs> so, but I mean. This to me is, you know, Nutanix, for example, comes in and says, hey, we can take away your infrastructure pain if you just stick to our reference architecture and let us have all the control. Is that infrastructure as code or is that, a, you know, where does that fit? Is it even worth discussing? Well, maybe a parallel to that is think okay. of it from the OCP perspective, right? Okay. So OCP was attempting to standardize that infrastructure layer, right? Here's the management API, here's the spec for the hardware. Um, how many people do you see deploying OCP hardware? It was ridiculously hard to manage and very few. Even, even Open19 is struggling from that perspective and that's just a mechanical spec. So, um, or, well, it, uh, or, it's, or it's not actually solving the problem that people have. Um, I, I will raise an exception. I am perhaps, I, I don't know how many people are on this, well, 10 on this. I perhaps am one who is running OCP, you know, in particular, the Sonic project for the network fabric itself. Okay. So what, what Kubernetes does for compute, Sonic lets you do for the network fabric, right? Um, and, and Microsoft, well, maybe Microsoft, but definitely Facebook runs OCP, but that's also why it's so twisted and opinionated towards that perspective because that's the Facebook framework. Well, uh, Microsoft Azure runs entirely, the network fabric is entirely Sonic, right? As yeah. is, as Microsoft is Microsoft and Facebook are the big, big companies in OCP, yep. But I mean, OCP really had two, two sides to it, right? Um, on an operation side, wouldn't it be nice if we had all commoditized hardware? We didn't have to worry about different firmwares, different X, Y, and Z. But probably the more effective tool was allowing me to play HP against every other vendor out there. Right? It's a great negotiation tool. I'm defining SEP to drive my like, point the lowest possible one in the market. Yep, yep. Right. So, um, 
but I mean, let's just face it, infrastructure, that, that, that layer of infrastructure is just hard. Because if, if you haven't commoditized um, other than things like PCI, right? Where do you have a, a commoditized or standardized interface? You never, you don't. I mean, you have, you have IP and even that, um, not so much. Yeah, there's, there's IP. I mean, yeah, there, there are standards, but you know, it's, it's an oxymoron to start having this discussion about, well, leading with a standard. Standard emerges, right? Once it becomes widely adopted, then yes, it happens. But you know, if you, if you want to lead with something, um, you can't wait for standards, right? Um, but within the OCP world, uh, there are lots of adjacent components that are very standards focused, right? Uh, they're coming out of academia, they're coming out of research institutions, and then OCP folds them in. Uh, for the programming stack, for instance, right? The SAI, which is the switch abstraction interface, that is a standard, right? Comes from standards and governance bodies, even though OCP is extremely new, right? Um, but technologies that's incorporating in, right? The P4 um, uh, programming language itself yep. or the network elements, right? So these are, these are standards, but somebody that's gonna pick up, a company that's gonna pick up a solution set that is OCP compliant, or you know that right. was birthed out of OCP. Um, they're they're not saying, well, you know, is Sonic a standard, right? Sonic ends up using standards, but Sonic itself is not a standard. Right? All they have to go on is, well, freaking Azure hyperscaler, Alibaba is using it, right? I mean, <clears throat> when when you say these cite these large large examples, then they get the warm and fuzzies, um, but I have rarely encountered a shop where the distinction ends up being, well, we're not, we, we're, when Nick Singh say OCP because we want to be an HP shop, then I don't know what else was on the floor if both of those are in the same room. <laughs> that, you know, if the choice is between something like Sonic or between a closed, entirely closed stack like Nutanix or HP. Um, that's well, I think and Rob's point about not getting the pick, right? Is you, you wind up with a hybrid environment and, and some of it is just technology curve group, right? When we started deploying all of the NICs were 1040s, then they went to 25, 100, right? All of a sudden, all my switching infrastructure doesn't match up anymore. That's, yeah. heter heterogeneity is not just a vendor thing. It's a, it's a, it's a life cycle thing. Yep. Yep. Um, and oh, and some of some of what you're describing for these hyperscalers is they have huge investments in management frameworks and tooling that I think, you know, um, is are very are, that's incredibly bespoke to how those clouds operate. It's not, you know, and they're not those aren't open sourced as part of the systems. They they really no. can't be. Uh, and a conversation I had yesterday with someone who used to be at Google is that. Kubernetes in Google is a much different beast than what's in the uh, open source totally community. Different. It's totally different than Borg. Yeah. yeah. And well, it's got I, all that management stuff and, and metrics and observability stuff already. It so, does, but to Rob's point, it's, it's written, applications in Google are written differently than you would write them for Kubernetes. And, and so it's very much an internal view of how they write applications and how they deploy it. Yep. So so I, I've been taking notes through this and I have a ton of um, points that out of the con conversation, um, we're not obviously, we were, I wasn't expecting to finish this one. One thing we didn't talk about at all, which surprises me because it's usually where infrastructure's code conversations seem to start, which is code repository. Like, you yeah. know, we mentioned GitOps a couple of times. It, it always comes to me, a lot of the infrastructure is code talks through, my automation is checked into Git. And then, and, and then falls down from there. Right. Um, is that just we just assumed it, or does does anybody think that's not a core? It, well, it, it's there, but it's not being good. Only thing I was going to say is uh, it's it's well understood that it needs to be a repository because where else are you going to keep the code if you have you know, multiple input points while well, I can make amends to running configuration that are not in the code repository, then you start talking about, you know, code drift. Uh, what's, what's your understanding of what's offline? Is it in agreement with what's actually running on the infrastructure? 
Um, but that's something, I mean, that's such poor hygiene and practice. It wouldn't matter if it was infrastructure as code or any code. Um, so it's, it's just, it's a primitive that we all just well understand, uh, right? If you don't have code repositories, um, then, you know, why are we even talking about code? <laughs> I, I think I, I agree with you. The, the thing that I see, though, is a lot of the tools that we talk about for infrastructure as code, you know, John Salt, um, you know, is, is a good example, it wasn't really designed to be checked into Git and managed in a, in a code controlled process. I'm um, not sure that's the limiting factor. What, what I would have said is what's missing. Um, so, yeah, we're working on three sets of things. We're working on um, a, a rapid application development platform with low code, no code support that's open source. Right. Yeah, forget the high price points on that. Um, we're, we're working on the repository in a different view. We're working on the repository as a social platform. Right. And if you think about going to the code repository today and you, you look at um, a piece of code, what do you do? You go look at the number of issues, number of pull requests, has it been active? You know, how many contributors are to these things? At the end of the day, trying to find good code inside of a repository, any kind of reuse to it, um, is, is almost impossible. Right. You, you'll get Cobra in the world of, of Go for the CLI because there's enough use in it to show those components into it. But how do you know which code is high quality? How do you know which code are the components to it? Um, and how do you solve the problem we're talking about last time, which is all the knowledge that is shared on whiteboards, but there's no way of capturing it. So I think the repository in a modern framework is a lot more important than we treat it today. Right. But it has to have a different dynamic to it. Um, so when I think about that, I think in a very different context and probably most people do. No, I, I, this is where I, I strongly agree with you, right? That the, the utility of storing your scripts in Git is not what we're talking about. Like we wouldn't pat each other on the back and say, I have checked all of my scripts into Git, into, into Git and now I'm infrastructure as code. That isn't addressing the problem that you were describing when you were like, oh, all my scripts are, you know, I have all these scripts connecting all this, all this, all this connective tissue. Um, yeah. And it's very right, subjective. Missing the reproducibility and the, the social aspect of transparency and understanding what the scripts do and what their side effects are. And it doesn't have proper metrics around it so we can measure it. Right. And, and so if you think about this, imagine now you've got source code sitting in a repository. And over time, I can build you know, machine learning components they say, hey, I know what you're doing. This is a, a good piece of code you can put into uh, these pieces to it. So, I mean, there's a lot of utility when you realize that, because I forget that one of the stats I looked at was um, how many repositories have more than one contributor, how many have more than 50, um, how many have more than 100, right? And, and even though there's millions of repositories created in GitHub every day, the number of active repositories is, is, is just about zero. Right, so there's a lot of crap in that repository, right? And I'm sure there's a lot of crap in enterprise repositories, right? And, and so the advantage of treating it socially and applying, you know, graph theories to it is I can visualize those things, I can learn from it, and I can steer things. Um, what, what you were describing is actually something um, I, I try to articulate, but it's, it's, it's a high value thing, which is when I write infrastructure as code, I want to be able to write the things that are novel and unique to me. And I want to reuse libraries that are um, standard and abstractions that I don't want to have to deal with. Yeah. So think of it in the, the, the context I would describe it in is, is we would describe, you know, core libraries as Legos. They're, they're building one, right? Some combination of those things form a blueprint. Maybe it's a, a, a worker pool pattern and go. Right, and, and what you need to add in, and all that code, by the way, is written over and over and over again, yeah, right? It's cut and pasted, it's copied, and everything else that goes into it. What I want to add, add to it is the part that's unique to me. Uh, I need to implement some job in a worker pool paradigm. Uh, I need to implement some piece of business logic into it. And, and I want those things to also be things that are discoverable and shareable, right? And I want them to be measurable. So that I'm not doing this just on a, hey, I found this, it looks good. I can actually do it based on, hey, in the where people used it, it's been deployed X number of times, it's had X reliability factors into it. Right? There's a bunch of attributes you can add to these things that are interesting. And they're interesting not only from the code, they're interesting from the human capital side too. 
right? right. Just... Get, GitHub is essentially an archive in most instances rather than a repository of living code. And this is something that I've been interested in for a while, and that is finding a way to curate the code bases that are out there to say, to, to get, you know, how, how much of it is in use, how long has it existed, how active is it, uh, what are uh, people's perspective, is it good, is it reliable, is it something that you should consider using or run away, <laughs> run away. And so it's like, how do you turn a repository into something useful? How do you turn, uh, uh, how do you judge code so that code, useful code is reusable and gets reused? Well, we're obviously past the hour and we define five separate things that we would wrap around that I can talk about. Um, that I think you're directionally towards it, but I tell you, it's not, <clears throat> it's not stack overflow, right? Where, <laughs> where the more you comment on things, the more you vote down, the, the higher your repudiation level goes, right? So I can go watch answers that are completely wrong, but I can't reply because I haven't actually contributed enough to be considered um, reputable in that society. So yeah. it, it starts with how do you curate it? And then the second piece underneath it is it needs to be data driven, right? It, it can't be just a human. Um, that's curating the material. You have to find ways of associating metrics, not only in the code itself, but through the deployment pipeline so that you have high confidence that the, the code may look good. I've seen really bad code that doesn't break. <laughs> right? So how do I know whether the code is truly you know, functioning at a high level, whether it's performance-based or it's failure-based or it's recovery-based? Um, you need ways of um, associating quality metrics with the code itself and then tracking that through the deployment process. So when you talk about infrastructure as code, I actually include getting the metrics back from the application so I can actually start tracking some of those things. Really intro. I'm, I'm thinking through, I mean, you had three more things, but we can hold that for another conversation and keep going. Oh, yeah, no, um, I didn't mean to go into those, but yeah. No, it's just, I, I still come back to on what you're saying. Yeah, Patrick, thank you. Everybody, we should wrap it up. I could yep. go on this for hours because this is what I'm actively working to define, but uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd like us, to get so the five you. points down in the future. Sure. Uh, and there's, there's, uh, there's, uh, so next time we'll go over it, there's like three blocks that I think I tried to identify over the last two years and what are the problems we need to solve. And then we get to the social application. There's like five points we think are important in, in what you get out of that. I can talk about those. And what I also like is, is to, um, it, it sounds like um, there's some pretty good knowledge around um, OCP. It'd be nice to go into more. I haven't looked at OCP in two years. So I'd be curious. Would you, would you, yeah, I would love an, an update for that. Um, even if it was just on the Sonic side, I would love to hear it. Everybody, right. have a great have a, holiday. Have a good holiday, everyone. For, for those thank you for joining us. Yep. Bye-bye. Stay safe.